we shall commence this module by understanding balance of payment in brief. Balance of payment that is BOP is a statistical statement which includes all transactions of a country with the rest of the world over a period of time. To make it more explicit, it includes not only the transactions in goods and services and incomes but also reflects upon the changes in claims and liabilities of a country vis-a-vis -vis rest of the world during the given period. It even includes unrequited transfers and entries for balancing the account. Such an account will be in equilibrium when demand for and supply of foreign exchange is exactly equal. If not, there will be a situation of disequilibrium, either a deficit or a surplus. In case of a BOP deficit, demand for foreign exchange will exceed its supply. On the other hand, a BOP surplus will be witnessed when supply of foreign exchange within a country is more than its demand. Both these situations will require some kind of measures to correct the disequilibrium. While some of the measures work in an automatic manner, other require deliberate initiatives. Usually automatic measures show result in long run, while for desired results in short run authorities introduce deliberate initiatives within the framework of monetary and fiscal policies. After studying this module, you shall be able to understand the relationship between devaluation and balance of payment disequilibrium, understand price and income induced adjustment process, learn the two basic approaches, the elasticity approach and the absorption approach, aware from other two approaches that is the monetary approach and the multiplier approach. Let us discuss about the gold standard and fixed exchange rate. In a historical context, monetary system was marked by the prevalence of gold standard under which every country used to announce the value of its currency in terms of gold. This was the era of fixed exchange rate and the currencies were either made of gold or fully gold convertible. Under it, the central bank was always ready to buy and sell gold at a specified price. It remained operational until the First World War, that is 1914. The era of fixed exchange rate under gold standard was from 1880 to 1914. This system was completely disrupted during the two world wars when the countries went for competitive devaluations and for erecting trade barriers. Subsequently, the Bretton's Wood Conference placed a new international monetary system under the supervision of newly created International Monetary Fund. Under it, each country was asked to announce market value of its currency in terms of gold or US dollar. The system allowed some flexibility to the currencies within a range of plus minus 1%. Any change in the currency value larger than this was through devaluation or revaluation by the central bank of the country in consultation with IMF. However, since early 70s, countries gradually abandoned it as well as in favor of a market driven flexible exchange rate system when the US dropped its historic dollar gold convertibility. It paved the way for flexible exchange rate regime. Next, we will learn about the price induced adjustment process. An advantage of the gold standard and fixed exchange rate system was that any disequilibrium in BOP of a country would have corrected automatically through a change in price levels which is followed from the operations of the market forces. A BOP deficit in a country under the gold standard means demand for foreign exchange exceeding its supply. This would pave the way for payments in the form of gold leading to a fall in stock of gold within the country. This will lower the money supply and in return a fall in the general price level. As a result, exports will rise and imports will fall leading to BOP deficit to narrow down establishing equilibrium at some point of time. Likewise, in case of BOP surplus, reserve activities will take place and money supply in the country will increase, price level will move up, exports will fall and imports will rise. This will also lead to establishing BOP equilibrium. Price specie flow mechanism. Such an adjustment process has been systematically presented by David Hume in the early 18th century in the form of a price specie flow mechanism which explains the effect of international transactions under gold standard. According to it, a surplus trade under gold standard would lead gold inflows in the economy. It would expand money supply which in turn would increase the price level as per quantity theory of money. 
This would adversely affect the price competitiveness of exportable and would make imports more lucrative. Hence, over time, exports would fall and imports would rise, wiping out the net exports. A reverse process would take place when a country suffers from net imports. Gold reserve would fall due to its outflow. Hence, money supply and prices would fall, exports would rise and imports would fall. As a result, trade deficit would gradually narrow down to zero. In a nutshell, under both the situations, surplus or deficit, the adjustment process would function automatically to restore the trade balance, that is, exports equals to imports. Such an automatic correction will be feasible only when there is a complete freedom to market forces to operate. Modern states being welfare states intervene in the economy heavily and significantly hamper the market forces. Hence, automatic correction does not take place or will take too long to complete. Hence, states introduce deliberate fiscal and monetary initiatives to reduce the BOP disequilibrium in the short run. A common form of market intervention is the devaluation under which value of currency is lowered or it is made cheaper in case of a BOP deficit. This would make exports price competitive and import expensive leading to exports to rise and imports to fall resulting into a gradual correction in the BOP deficit towards equilibrium. However, effectiveness of it depends upon several factors which have been highlighted under different approaches to the BOP adjustment. Moving on to discuss the income induced adjustment process and it was given by Keynes. Keynes has argued that BOP imbalance is adjusted through a change in income, employment and output in an economy and not through price adjustment as captured under the above explained automatic process. Hence, it assumes all the price as well as wages, interest rates, exchange rates, etc. to remain constant and BOP adjustment is brought through automatic income changes. Incidentally, the contribution of Keynes in this regard was indirect one as adjustment mechanism represents the application of Keynesian economics to open economy which aimed at income levels where an economy will have full employment. Keynes mechanism is based on interaction between BOP and the income levels of the home country which reaches to the rest of the world through a transmission process. In a nutshell, the adjustment mechanism involves two processes an income induced adjustment process and a transmission process. Income adjustment in one country will thus transmit to other countries through BOP adjustment. In the process, income multiplier will also play a key role. Keynes explained that the BOP deficit will adjust itself by the relative movement of national income in the same direction. That is, income level will fall in case of a deficit country and will rise in case of a surplus country, assuming static productivity conditions. The equilibrium condition in case of a small country can be stated as follows. I plus X minus M is equals to S, where the X minus M, the BOP balance, represents net foreign investment income, I is the domestic investment and S is the domestic savings. In case of equilibrium level of income, net foreign investment income and domestic investment will be equals to domestic saving. If the country suffers from BOP deficit, that is X minus M is negative, then the investment would exceed the domestic savings, implying the inflow of foreign income or investment for equilibrium level of income to be established. This would gradually facilitate the reduction in BOP deficit. On the contrary, if the country enjoys a BOP surplus, domestic savings would exceed the investment, implying outflow of foreign income or investment for equilibrium level of income. This would gradually facilitate reduction in the BOP surplus. At some stage, BOP balance would be restored. There are four different approaches relating to BOP adjustment in the theory of international economics, elasticity approach, absorption approach, monetary approach and multiplier approach. Let us discuss the first approach that is elasticity approach. It is a traditional approach to understand BOP adjustment following a deliberate change in the exchange rate through devaluation. It takes change in price that is exchange rate as a determinant of the BOP. The model assumes capital flows across countries just as a means of financing current account transactions and balance of payment represents current account balance only. 
This approach is based upon the fact that a change in exchange rate of a country affects its relative price of domestic and foreign goods. It brings an impact on respective demands of exports and imports which in turn may reduce BOP disequilibrium. A devaluation of rupee, for example, should lead to an increase in foreign demand of Indian goods by the way of lowering their prices and a decrease in Indian demand of foreign goods through increasing import prices. As such, export earnings should rise and import payments should fall, resulting in lowering BOP deficit. To what extent such an effect will take place in an economy will depend upon the price responsiveness of both exports and imports, which is indicated through their respective elasticities. This approach elaborates the effect of elasticities on the BOP disequilibrium. Export earnings and elasticity of demand. If exports are price elastic, that is the elasticity of exports is greater than 1, then devaluation will cause a significant rise in the nation's exports, increasing foreign exchange earnings considerably. In this regard, the figure shows an elastic export demand indicating a rise in export from OQ1 to OQ2 following a fall in the price of the foreign currency, that is the exchange rate, from OP1 to OP2, which is equals to P1, P2. Loss to the country due to a fall in the price is estimated as EG P2 P1, which is smaller than that of gains FG Q1 Q2 due to the increased demand. Thus, the net effect will be higher for an exchange earnings by the country post devaluation. In a similar fashion, the figure exhibits the case of an inelastic demand reflecting upon the net fall in the foreign exchange earnings of the country post devaluation since gains due to the increased demands that is FG Q1 Q2 are smaller than that of the losses EG P2 P1 due to a fall in prices. In case of a unitary elastic demand, both the effects will be equal that is EG P2 P1 will be equals to FG Q1 Q2 and hence there will be no change in the foreign exchange earnings of the country post devaluation. Next is the import payments and elasticity of demand. Similar to exports, imports are also price sensitive. As noted, devaluation will make imports expensive in terms of local currency despite no change in their respective prices denominated in the foreign currency. This should result into a fall in the import demand and in turn the import bill depending upon their price elasticity. If imports are price elastic, that is the elasticity of imports is greater than 1, then devaluation will cause a significant fall in the nation's import demand, lowering the size of foreign exchange payments. Other things remaining the same, it will lower the BOP deficit. The figure represents a case of elastic import demand. It measures import price in terms of domestic currency. Prior to devaluation, import price is OP2 and imports OQ2. Post devaluation, import prices in domestic currency rose to OP1 and as a result, elastic import fell subsequently to OQ1. One can see that increase in foreign payments in domestic currency is smaller, that is P1RTP2, as compared to the fall in the same, that is TSQ1 Q2. The net effect will therefore be the savings in foreign payments, which will lead to improving the BOP disequilibrium. However, if imports are relatively inelastic, that is, it is the elasticity of imports is less than 1 but greater than 0, then import demand will be less affected by its higher price in terms of domestic currency and hence import bill may fall marginally or may even rise. In the figure, the demand curve is relatively steeper representing inelastic demand. As such, when import price rises following devaluation, demand falls to some extent. However, fall in foreign payments in domestic currency is smaller, that is TSQ2Q1, as compared to the rise in payments, that is P1P2RT. The net effect will be some rise in BOP deficit post devaluation. The extent of such an effect will depend upon how much inelastic is the demand of imports. As an extreme situation, if imports are completely inelastic, then there will be no change in their respective import demand, but import prices will move up. I represent, but import prices will move up and hence foreign exchange requirement for payment will short up. It will therefore further worsen the POP deficit post devaluation. The actual impact of devaluation on the BOP disequilibrium will be a cumulative effect of both on exports and imports. 
this has been captured by martial and learner condition the next is martial learner condition martial and learner separately attempted to capture the net effect of price elasticities of exports and imports of bop equilibrium it is commonly termed as martial learner condition it states that devaluation will improve the country's balance of payment if the sum of the price elasticities of demand for exports and imports is absolute term is greater than unity that is the elasticity of export plus the elasticity of import is greater than 1 where ex denotes demand elasticity of export and em represents the demand elasticity of imports so we can also write that ex plus em is greater than 1 if sum of the above stated two elasticities is less than unity then devaluation will increase the bop deficit and if it is equals to 1 then devaluation will have no effect on the bop situation that is the deficit will remain unchanged implicitly it means that even if one of the two elasticities is zero the effect of devaluation on bop disequilibrium could be favorable provides the other one is more than unit elastic that is bop effect would be positive even if em is equals to zero and ex is greater than one or ex is equals to zero and em is greater than one in case of most developing countries both exports and imports are by and large price inelastic imports mostly for developed purposes cannot be reduced and hence assume a price inelastic nature similarly exports largely for primary products and light resource based manufacturers are also characterized by low price elasticity many times thus such countries do not witness a positive effect on devaluation in case in many cases the BOP disequilibrium has worsened post devaluation. Let us now understand the J curve effect. Even if devaluation lowers the BOP deficit, it is very unlikely that it will improve the BOP position of the country immediately. The BOP deficit may rather increase first before it declines as represented by the J curve effect. This has been shown in the diagram. One can observe from the figure that the curve is a J shaped one which has a big loop in the beginning between point R and S for time between T0 and T1. Subsequent to time T1, it slopes upward indicating reduction in the BOP deficit. The equilibrium is established at time T2. Beyond time T2, the country may enjoy a BOP surplus at point V. If the Marshall Lerner condition is not satisfied, the J curve will be flatter between T0 and T2 in the long run. Such a response to devaluation is attributable to various kinds of time lags associated with decision making, delivery, replacement and production. In other words, some amount of time is required for the price mechanism to induce changes in the volume of exports and imports. They may be due to the following reasons. First, time taken in deciding to set up a new business that is decision lag. Second, time taken in placing orders for new machinery etc that is delivery lag third time taken in fulfilling the orders placed for new installations that is replacement lags and fourth time taken in producing goods whose demand has increased that is production lag empirically estimate indicates that such time lags may vary from country to country now let us discuss the absorption approach this approach was developed by sydney s alexander in 1952 he called it absorption approach of balance of trade disequilibrium since under it trade balance depends upon the fact that how much of national income or output the economy consumes or absorbs. Accordingly, the balance of trade of an economy is the difference between what the economy produces and what it consumes. In other words, balance of trade in goods and services rely upon how domestic spending changes in relation to domestic production. He started with the national income identity which shows national income y as a summation of consumption domestic investment and trade balance where x represents exports and m represents imports hence we can write y is equals to c plus i plus x minus m in this framework c plus i represents the consumption and investment and thus it represents domestic absorption since it includes the expenditure on both consumption and investment goods this has been denoted by A. Similarly, trade balance that is X minus M is denoted by B. Therefore, the national income identity can be represented as Y is equals to A plus B and the trade balance as B is equals to Y minus A.
It means that trade balance will be net of national income or production minus domestic absorption. If total output of the country exceeds its absorption, it will be net exporter and this will be reflected as trade account surplus. Similarly, if total output of the country is less than its absorption, then the nation will be net importer and this will be reflected as current account deficit. For trade deficit, B, to reduce either country's income Y, should rise or its domestic absorption A should fall following devaluation. However, if a condition of full employment prevails in the country, income or output cannot rise and hence trade deficit will fall only when domestic absorption falls. A contraction in domestic absorption may be automatic or may be achieved through deliberate changes in fiscal and monetary policies. An automatic reduction in absorption is possible if devaluation causes income redistribution from wage earners who have high MPC to the profit earners who have low MPC. Thus, they will save a larger proportion of incremental income lending domestic absorption to fall. At the same time, the value of real cash balance in the hands of public at large will also fall as the devaluation will result into inflation. As such, public will also lower its absorption to restore the value of real cash balance. At the same time, rising money income due to inflation will increase tax burden, again lowering the absorption. All these consequences will thus result into an automatic fall in domestic absorption following the currency devaluation. The problem with such an automatic adjustment process is that it is difficult to predict the time taken by the automatic process to complete and the strength of the changes. Therefore, authorities often introduce deliberate initiatives through the instruments of fiscal and monetary policies to achieve a reduction in domestic absorption for lowering trade deficit. For example, to reduce the BOP deficit, interest rates may be hiked which would discourage domestic investment, reduce income level and in turn lower the demand for imports. As such, import will fall causing a favorable effect on BOP deficit. Further, it will encourage the inflow of foreign capital which will help the country to lower the BOP deficit. Suppose the country devalues its currency to reduce its trade deficit, then its output and exports will rise without causing inflation provided there are unemployed resources. However, if a condition of full employment prevails in the country, then devaluation will lead exports to increase along with the domestic prices or inflation. Moving on to discuss the monetary and multiplier approach. In addition to the above mentioned two approaches, there are two more approaches relating to the BOP adjustment. They are the monetary approach and the multiplier approach. The monetary approach explains the balance of payments disequilibrium in terms of monetary parameters, that is the money people want to hold and the amount supplied by the monetary authorities. The multiplier approach on the other hand is a modified and extended version of the elasticity approach. Under it, the exchange rate is assumed to be fixed and the adjustment process is analyzed under a pegged regime. The BOP adjustment will cause a change in the national income. Let us now summarize what we have learned in this module. The brief analysis carried out above has enlightened us regarding the BOP disequilibrium and how it can be brought in a balanced state. We have observed that the adjustment process can be understood from four different approaches.